Okay. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. I want to thank you all for joining the International and Government Relations Committee session. I am Dr. Latanya Mitchell. I'm the Program Division uh, Director for the Office of Human and Animal Food Operations, uh, Division West II, within the Office of Regulatory Affairs at the Food and Drug Administration. And so I, along with Sally Powell Price, who's a regulatory expert for food safety for Millipore Sigma, serve as the co-chairs for this committee. And so first, we just want to extend a warm welcome to everyone and I'm glad you took time out of your schedule to register and attend our committee session. Uh, we also, I also want to acknowledge or we want to acknowledge and extend our gratitude to our committee members who suggested today's topics as well as help secure today's speakers. So before we get started with the two great topics we have today, I have some committee business and housekeeping items to discuss. So just as a way of introduction, the International and Government Relations Committee um, is to achieve a mutual working relationship between AFDO, um, the Association for Food and Drug Officials, and federal, state, in local governments in accomplishing the goals and objectives of AFDO in relation to consumer protection in the food, drug, and product safety fields. So we have four main objectives, and they are to serve as a focal point for the committee of AFDO and the federal, state, and local governments in matters where intergovernmental activities are crucial to accomplishing AFDO's national objectives, the second one is to promote the establishment and implementation of uniform procedures, codes, agreements among various units of government within food, drugs, and product safety agencies. And the third is to recommend to the AFDO board new programs and activities where intergovernmental relations can be utilized to accomplish the goals and objectives of the association. And the fourth is to serve as an advisory to the board um, on implementation of national strategies and programs of the association. So for the 2023 and 2024 season, the committee had three charges. And the first charge was to identify topics of interest in international speakers for the annual conference. So of course, this charge is being fulfilled today. And our first topic will be on the antimicrobial resistance of food safety a regulatory perspective. And the second topic is on the regulatory and industry challenges of PFAS in food, beverage, and consumer products. I would like to mention though that on April 18th of this year, our committee and the Laboratory Science and Technology Committee hosted Dr. Stick Harris. He's the director of the Coordinated Outbreak Response and Evaluation Network, CORE. And it was a very informative session that included Dr. Harris providing an overview of what CORE does and its responsibilities that take place at FDA. So in addition to charge one, the committee also had two additional charges this year. The second was to identify training needs of states who regulate imported products. And we're supposed to provide this information to the AFDO board with suggestions um, for any new trainings needed to be created. And so the committee had several conversations with FDA's Office of Import Operations and on potential training and learning areas. One was possibly have a two-way conversation of how states versus FDA manage imports and what pathways are used may be interesting to potential training topics to be held either at an AFDO meeting or another platform. And the second was also providing scenarios where FDA is integrating artificial intelligence. And this goal is to see where else this could be applied effectively and accurately to better target and use regulatory resources. And the third charge is to identify key individuals from other countries across government industry stakeholder groups to work within the committee and AFDO. And so we have several committee members have connections with the international community. And so our IGRC, our International Government Relations Committee created and shared a committee specific survey to identify members and specific expertise. 
We also connected with members of WHO, the World Health Organization, to engage as speakers for our annual committee session. And then recently, our very own committee co-chair, Sally, collaborated with international regulatory and academic stakeholders in Maru, Kenya, and at Penn State for Food Safety Seminar Series to increase awareness and international dialogues on food safety issues. And so this opportunity provided a, for a two-way discussion with Kenya regulators, food safety stakeholders, and North American stakeholders. Okay, and so before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping. First, we ask that you keep your microphones on mute when you're not speaking so that we can hear whoever is speaking clearly. And this kind of helps to minimize the presenting the underground, underwater sound effect um, and interruption from the background noises. And then we will allow a time at the end of each topic to ask questions. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat box, but Sally will provide some additional information and instructions on how to submit questions. And one question I can't answer in advance is that the speakers, uh, if they're able to share their slides, we will post them under the committee portal on the AFTO website. But we are also recording the presentation as well. And so we'll post that to the portal as well. And if we have time at the end, either Steve or I will show you uh, where the portal is located. So I have taken care of all the committee business. And so I'm now gonna turn over my virtual camera over to Sally who will moderate today's topics and introduce our speakers. So Sally, take it away. Thanks, LaTanya. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm Sally Paul Price, a regulatory expert for food safety with Millipore Sigma, but my role today with AFTO is as a co-chair for this committee. Um, I'm very excited to have a series of speakers with us that will uh, join us on two very cool topics that were identified by our committee earlier this year, as LaTanya said. So our first topic will be antimicrobial resistance surveillance for food safety, and this is more of a regulatory perspective. As we know, AFTO covers um, regulatory industry industry, academia, and around, around the, the um, all of our stakeholders. And so today we're excited to have kind of representatives from all those groups. This first topic session will be primarily regulatory focused. So on this topic, and the reason this was identified is that the increased concern around antimicrobial resistance globally has really led to some interesting challenges for oversight, both domestically and internationally. So it is an international issue. Um, our speakers today are going to introduce and discuss the National Antimicrobial Monitoring System, so NARMS, um, and provide some examples of its application in monitoring and evaluating the risk of AMR while maintaining a safe uh, human and animal food supply chain. Now, our first speaker will be Dr. Heather Tate. And then our, unfortunately, our second speaker, Dr. Harbottle, was not well today. So um, we have a wonderful other speaker that has stepped in for her, Dr. Ron Miller. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Tate for us and let her take it away. Uh, so Dr. Tate uh, is currently the interim science lead for the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System at the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. She has over 15 years of experience in the development and implementation of AMR surveillance systems and has published research um, on epidemiology of AMR enteric bacteria. She holds, holds a doctorate of science from New York University and a master's degree in epidemiology from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Tate, we're so happy to have you today. Um, those who have questions for our sessions, by the way, uh, please pop them in the chat. We'll do a Q&A after each, uh, both of our speakers. So um, just hold your questions to the end and we'll take it from there. So Dr. Tate, with that, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to say hi with my video on. I'm going to turn it off so I don't distract myself while I'm talking. And uh, let me now share my screen. Change some things around and now share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you all can see my presentation and presentation view. Um, so yes, as Sally uh, said that I will be talking about NARMS and then my colleague Dr. Miller will be talking about how NARMS data are used for regulatory purposes at CVM. Um, so, and I also want to state that even though we're talking about antimicrobial resistance surveillance for human food safety, this is from the CVM perspective. While I know that CIFSAN is doing work also in this area, I'm not knowledgeable enough to be able to tell you about all that they're doing. So this is from the CVM perspective. 
So um, why is CVM interested in antimicrobial resistance? Um, that's because we regulate antimicrobials used in food animal production, um, and we approve antimicrobials to treat diseased animals, control outbreaks of disease, and also to prevent infections. In order for us to approve a drug, we have to determine that the drug is safe and effective for its intended use in an animal. And we also have to determine that the antimicrobial is safe with regard to human health. Um, and so this is sort of the jumping point for how NARMS got started. Uh, so back in 1995, um, FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine, approved a drug called serifloxacin, which was the first fluoroquinolone um, agent that was um, uh, approved for use in animals intended for food. And the labeling claim was that this drug would control illness caused by E. coli in poultry. A year later, we approved another fluoroquinolone called enrofloxacin for use in poultry. However, shortly after approval of these two drugs, there were concerns raised about the potential risk for transfer of resistant bacteria and resistance genes from animals to humans. In fact, CDC had conducted a study where they had shown that there was an increase in resistance to these drugs among Campylobacter that had been isolated from sick persons. And so in 97, as a result of these discussions and concerns, CVM placed an extra label prohibition on the use of fluoroquinolones in food animals. Um, shortly after that, FDA formed a veterinary medical advisory committee to respond to the public health concerns. And the purpose of the committee was to review all the information um, associated with the approvals of those two drugs. The committee uh, recommended that FDA establish a monitoring program for antimicrobial resistance so that we could continue to ensure the safety and effectiveness of fluoroquinolones and other antimicrobial products. And so thus NARMS was born. Um, and we were originally intended to function as a post-approval safety monitoring system for FDA regulated products. But as my colleague, Dr. Miller, will um, explain to you, we're also used for pre-approval purposes as well, or the data from NARMS is used for pre-approval. So the mission of NARMS is to provide scientifically reliable data to help reduce the human, animal, and environmental health burden caused by antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And in achieving our mission, what we do is we look for trends in antimicrobial resistance, or I'll say AMR for short. Now, AMR among enteric bacteria from humans, retail meats, and animals at slaughter. Um, as you can see in the figure here, um, there are three different agencies that actually look at those three different um, sources. Um, so CDC is um, looking at anima, uh, AMR bacteria from humans, um, FDA from retail meats, and USDA from animals at slaughter. We're also doing research so that we can understand how AMR emerges and persists and spreads. And then um, all three agencies put out both separate reports and integrated reports um, that contain um, the surveillance information so that our stakeholders can use these data um, to uh, promote inter uh, interventions that reduce resistance. We also um, support outbreak investigations that are conducted by CDC and USDA. And then finally, we provide data that assists FDA in making decisions related to the approval of safe and effective drugs. As I said, my colleague, Dr. Miller, will talk about. So our program is a lab-based surveillance program. We're basically taking the samples I talked about. We're culturing them for bacteria, certain bacteria, which I'll get into in a little bit. And then we're conducting testing on those bacteria. Our predominant tests that we conduct are antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, mostly using broth microdilution methods. And then we also um, uh, perform whole genome sequencing on these isolates. When NARMS was first established, whole genome sequencing didn't exist, or at least not at the scale that it, that it exists now. Um, and so 
our program was predominantly collecting information on AMR through antimicrobial susceptibility testing or phenotypic um, antimicrobial susceptibility. As time has evolved and whole genome sequencing has become a very reliable um, uh, testing method that provides a lot of data with, you know, just a um, just one lab test, we've relied on whole genome sequencing now to um, provide predicted antimicrobial resistance phenotypes. And so we're using more and more whole genome sequencing. We still use antimicrobial susceptibility testing on a portion of the isolates that we test, um, but that's mostly to confirm um, resistance genotypes and also to perhaps discover um, antimicrobial uh, resistance for which there is no known mechanism. Um, so we've done quite a few studies in the past where we have shown that you can reliably predict resistance using whole genome sequencing. These are just a few of the studies that have come from NARMS and a number of other institutions and organizations have, have also done similar studies showing that you can predict antimicrobial resistance in at least the, the, the bacteria that we surveil uh, for NARM, Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, and um, somewhat through uh, Enterococcus, and also Staph pseudoindermedius, which is um, an organism that is um, surveilled through VetLearn, which is a NARM's partner, and I'll talk about them in a little bit. So here's the One Health scope of NARMS. Um, I already talked about how we're collecting information from humans, retail meats and food animals, and how CDC um, is collecting that information from humans in a partnership with um, all 50 state health departments. Obviously the people, um, uh, or sorry, this, the, uh, the bacteria are coming from ill persons, and they're looking at Salmonella, E. coli 157, Shigella, Campylobacter, Vibrio, and Salmonella typhi. And then FDA, we partner with 15 health departments and um, uh, institutions of higher education in seven states and Puerto Rico. Um, and so with those institutions and health departments, we actually... Um, fund them to go to grocery stores in their local area and collect samples of the retail meats and seafood that you see listed here. And then they isolate Salmonella, E. coli, Enterococcus, Campylobacter um, with the seafood now being a part of the NARMS the surveillance uh, sources. We're also isolating Vibrio and Aeromonas. And then of course, conducting further testing to establish their anti sorry their antimicrobial um, susceptibility um, genotype and phenotype profiles. Then USDA um, is you know they're they're in the plant and they are conducting um, susceptibility testing on isolates that are coming from animal sika as well as the regulatory samples that they are collecting. Um, uh, to understand contamination in the plant. And so as you can see, there's overlap here for the sources that they're looking at, chickens, um, they look at turkeys, we look at ground turkey from the grocery store. They're looking at both dairy and beef cattle. We're collecting ground beef. Um, and they're also looking at market and sow, market hog and sow, we're, we're looking at pork. And then, um, there's been some other sources that have been looked at on a smaller scale uh, with a with a shorter temporal um, focus, and those are listed in blue here. And again, there's overlap with the bacteria that we're looking. So we can really, we can really, you know, um, NARMS through the years has been a, has been considered a integrated. Um, food safety program and that we're look we were looking from farm to fork um, for antimicrobial resistance among these uh, foodborne pathogens. But now more recently, we have um, been able to label ourselves as a one health program because now we are considering environmental as well as, um, uh, as environmental bacteria as well as bacteria, 
um, that are causing animals to get sick. So as I said uh, before, we have a partnership with VetLearn, which is um, run through FDA. It's the Veterinary Laboratory Investigation and Response Network, which is housed also at CVM. And um, also they also work with the USDA National Animal Health Laboratory Network and veterinary diagnostic labs across 32 states, as well as Canada. And so they're collecting information from sick animals, including poultry, cattle, pigs, and also pets, dogs, cats, aquaculture, some of which are um, aquaculture for food and some of which are um, aquaculture for pets. And then they also look at other sources on a periodic basis. And you can see there again is some overlap with the organisms that they've looked at and that NARMS has traditionally looked at. And then environmental, I'll explain a little bit more in a, a few slides from now, but we have a partnership with EPA, um, as well as the USDA Agricultural Research Service to look at antimicrobial resistance in organisms from, um, from surface waters. And then um, we consider NCBI sort of a NARMS adjacent partner uh, because, as I said, we're doing whole genome sequencing on um, a lot of the organisms that we culture, and those uh, whole genome sequences end up being submitted to NCBI's um, pathogen detection database. Um, this I just threw in here so you can get like a better, a uh, better the uh, visualization of where are the partners that um, FDA is participating with to collect retail meats from grocery stores. So you can see we cover a large swath of the uh, of consumers in the US. So I also said before that we make our data accessible to stakeholders, and that's through various dashboards that we have on our website. Um, if you scan this QR code, you can go to the website where you can see um, and access all of these different uh, dashboards that we have. Uh, NARMS Now Integrated Data has um, um, both whole genome sequencing and susceptibility testing data. It is almost real time because the uh, state partners that are collecting the meats and culturing them for bacteria, they are also doing sequencing um, within about a week or two of when the, the meat is, sorry about that, within um, the time that the meat is collected. And so that information again is being uploaded to NCBI and we're pulling that information down to go into these dashboards. Um, NARMS Now Human Data is um, basically the same thing that's happening on the human side with CDC. And this is available, um, this particular dashboard is available on CDC's website, but you can find a link to it on our website. Um, the animal pathogen AMR data, this is the VetLearn and NALN data that I talked about, um, where you can see antimicrobial resistance um, from, e I think it's both E. coli and Staph pseudointermediates isolated from dogs. And then we have Resistome Tracker, which is more of a global tool. tool. It's not specific just to NARMS, um, but it's really just um, uh, calling the the NCBI database for all antimicrobial resistance information that's been submitted from all over the world and trying to use that as a means of tracking where resistance genes um, first emerged and then how they sort of spread globally and in what sources, et cetera. So. All right, so now a little bit more about our partnership with EPA. Um, so again, this is really what pushes us into that one health paradigm. Um, so we're looking at surface waters um, because our um, there has been much conversation about you know where is what is the sampling point to to turn an AMR integrated monitoring program to and one health program and that is water because they are the key environmental integrators. Um, so uh, we've got two studies that uh, we're actually, the, the, the studies have finished, we're actually doing the analysis now. Um, and one is looking at AMR bacteria from the East Fork Little Miami watershed. Um, this was a small um, 
uh, a very uh, short term pilot study uh, where there were different uh, collection points in this watershed and water was collected and metadata, lots of metadata was also collected. It's metadata such as urban ag transition, where the septic systems were, where the recreational waters were and the agricultural input, inputs were. And so this, this um, work is still being analyzed right now. We also, the second um, study that uh, EPA has been leading is uh, leveraging their NURSA study, which is a study that occurs every few years. Um, and there are all these red dots are all these are all different sampling points for the NURSA study, but sort of leveraging that to get more information about antimicrobial resistance and more information, um, more metadata that can help us uh, sort of figure out um, um, potential risk factors and sources of antimicrobial resistant bacteria. Um, this one it, it would, you know, would give us a lot of information, but it's more of a snapshot. The second one, um, leveraging EPA programs, the nurses study in particular, this uh, will allow us to see things um, more on a temporal basis across, across a longer period of time, because again, these studies happen every few years. Um, so with both of those studies, the analytical targets are Enterococcus and E. coli, um, specifically um, uh, vancomycin resistant Enterococcus and uh, extended spectrum beta lactamase uh, expressing E. coli. And then also salmonella is another uh, target. Um, the analyses that are being conducted. So not only are we doing culture, but we're also doing target gene analysis. So using a panel of AMR genes, about 90 to 100 genes that are important to uh, human, animal, and environmental health. And also on this panel are fecal source tractor trackers. So we can kind of get a sense of what might be the sources of these AMR genes. And then we're also doing metagenomic analysis um, uh, with and without enrichment. Um, and so this allows us to look at AMR um, on a broader scale at the sample, um, at, at the level of the sample rather than the level of the, of the individual bacterium. And I think this might be my last slide or second to last slide, but we are also conducting research in NARMS um, as I pointed out in one of the first few slides. And so, you know, we're using third generation sequencing or long read sequencing uh, to allow us to look at the location of resistance determinants on plasmids and also where they might be in the chromosome, whether they are on a plasmid or, or chromosome. Um, we're looking, we're developing plasmid typing tools. Uh, we're using this information to characterize mobile genetic elements. You know, are these are these resistance genes um, in a mobile genetic element where they can be hor horizontally transferred to other bacteria? And then we're also looking, you know, as we look at the location of these resistance determinants, we're looking to see, okay, are there other genes next to these resistance genes, such as biocide resistance genes, or heavy metal um, resistance genes that might be turning on if these bacteria are exposed to heavy metals, could these also turn on you know, some of these resistance genes that are next to it or co-located with it? And we're also using artificial intelligence and machine learning for resistance prediction. Um, which has been something that's kind of uh, emerged recently as a really interesting tool um, to help us sort of move away from the traditional susceptibility testing. Um, but again, utilizing the whole genome sequencing, not only to predict whether something is resistant or susceptible, but also now to predict an MIC value, um, you know, is, a, what is the actual minimum inhibitory concentration for a particular drug um, and bug combination? And then also trying to incorporate metagenomics more into 
um, our surveillance um, or as a tool for our surveillance. So um, these are things that we are working on. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at this email. Thank you so much, Dr. Tate. That was so interesting. I'm going to be good and not ask all my questions right now. <laughs> Um, we will, for everyone in the audience, we will host a Q&A right after um, the next speaker for both Dr. Tate and Dr. Miller. So feel free to put those questions in the chat. And then thank you so much, Dr. Tate, again, for that really insightful talk. It was very interesting. Um, our next speaker today uh, is kindly replacing our speaker, Dr. Harbottle. This is Dr. Ron Miller. Um, he is a regulatory review microbiologist in the Division of Human Food Safety for FDA's Center of Veterinary Medicine. He earned his master's of science degree in veterinary micro from LSU, where his thesis involved the study of the hybrid striped bass antibody response and its role in protection against phytobacterium fish pathogens. Um, I'm abbreviating this a little bit, Dr. Miller, but <laughs> hopefully I'm getting it correct. Uh, also comparing the efficacy of vaccines related to those bacteria. He went on to earn his PhD from the University of Maryland in marine estuarine and environmental sciences. He developed an HPLC method and microbiological assay to detect oxytetracycline in incurred fish serum. His postgrad work included standardization of first two, the first two antimicrobial susceptibility testing methods for bacterial pathogens in fish. Very impressive. And these methods were officially endorsed uh, and accepted by the International consensus standard setting body, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI. So thank you so much, Dr. Miller, for joining us today, last minute. Uh, looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Sally. Uh, just a quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. And the slides are coming up great. Good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm subbing in for uh, my colleague, Heather Harbottle, who is um, out sick today, but I uh, hope she's feeling better. Um, but yeah, I'd like, like to talk with everybody today about um, antimicrobial resistance evaluation of foodborne pathogens and FDA's pre-approval approach to um, how we evaluate these uses in food producing animals and uh, specifically how we use uh, the NARMS data that we just uh, heard all about. So we, on our team, in the Division of Human Food Safety in the Office of New Animal Drug Evaluation, we assure the safety of drug residues that humans consume from edible tissues of the treated animals. And uh, drug residues can be loosely defined as chemical residues or also antimicrobial resistant, resistant bacteria. So we understand that there's a there's never a zero risk. A zero risk is not a uh, reasonable um, expectation. So we have a safety standard of a reasonable certainty of no harm. And uh, we evaluate these that uh, safety standard using what's called a risk assessment process. And the risk is defined as the hazard times the exposure. And it's, uh, again, the, to the toxicity the due to the chemical residues, as well as antimicrobial resistance, which we'll talk about today. Um, the way we would do so is we assess the potential hazard posed by the drug substance and mitigate that human exposure to the potential hazard uh, to meet that reasonable certainty of no harm. And so the edible tissues, as you'd all expect, are uh, muscle, liver, kidney, fat, skin, milk, eggs, and honey. And then we... In our division of human food safety, we, like I said, evaluate uh, the safety based on like, toxicology, residue chemistry, and microbial food safety. So the toxicology evaluation and residue chemistry evaluations are used to essentially come up with a withdrawal period for the basically the amount of time that would be needed after the uh, treatment for the drug to be sufficiently gone from the system. Um, so that the animal could be harvested for food. And then the macro food safety evaluation is done similarly, but we also are mostly concerned with the animal cooking resistance endpoints and uh, trying to mitigate that risk for the, um, for the end user, i.e. the consumer of the meat. So like I said, the uh, we wanna mitigate that hazard when that hazard is identified and defined as being the human illness that would be um, the, the treatment of a human illness that would be compromised 
um, treatment for. Sorry, Dr. Miller, I just checking in. If you're looking to advance your slides, I think we're still in the first uh, first Ooh. slide. Okay. Maybe I can get some advice on how to. And also, if you can speak a little bit more into the mic, it's kind of hard to hear you as well. Okay. So... Yep, now you're on the anti uh, history of antimicrobial development slide. That yeah. looks, yep, you're good. Heather Kay, how do you, I think you had a presentation mode. How did you do that? Uh, presentation mode, I put it in and then I shared my screen where the full, um, where the where the presentation mode was showing. Right now we see the, um, yeah, not, like the editing. Right, right, right. I think you can just hit slideshow. So where your cursor just was, Dr. Miller, uh, yeah. down to the right. Yep, I think yeah. you can just hit that. And it should give you, okay. and then select this that screen to share. One. That's what I did before. And it makes me back out and get. This also works if you're comfortable with it, Dr. Miller, and you just want to advance this way. It is in the edit screen, but we can see the slide. So yeah, yeah. it's absolutely fine if you, if that's easier. It must have just gone in a different sequence or something from, from sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, this is what, this is where I was, the anaphobic resistance cartoon slide. So uh, um, this is just a fun little thing, basically showing that, uh, you know, we're, whenever antibiotics are used, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of thought that they're feeding superbugs like MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, um, and the antibiotics are being injected into our milk and into our food and and everything. So um, it's coming at us from all different directions. So we, we understand there's we're never going to have a zero risk, but we can do what we can to mitigate that risk. Um, the history of development and emergence of resistance. Whenever there's a um, drug that comes onto the market, you know, no matter how it's used, there's going to be eventually uh, antimicrobial resistance development to the to that drug class. So this this slide kind of shows that. So you know, even back in the 1930s, 1940s, when sulfonamides and uh, the penicillins were developed. Um, resistance developed shortly thereafter and then similarly with other compounds uh, later in the century uh, resistance developed then as well i'm not going to dwell too much on this my colleague heather tate did a great job uh, summarizing the development of norms and the chronology of um of its uh coming to age with the science and the expertise within fda cdc and usda uh, but we do have down here below the development of NARMS, um, some very important uh, guidance for industry document developments that kind of um, encapsulated our, our um, positions on antimicrobial resistance and judicious use and, um, and kind of approaching best approaches for how to uh, deal with antimicrobial resistance from a regulatory perspective. And then this next slide here shows similarly, you know, some of the most recent uh, development of guidance for industries, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but uh, also the the insertion of the VetLearn program, which uh, Dr. Tate spoke about as well. Um, and we, we use, suffice it to say that we use NARMS data and, um, and the VetLearn data routinely in our pre-market evaluations for microbial food safety and antimicrobial resistance. We rely very heavily on that data. So therapeutic uses of medically important antimicrobials um, can be put into three different um, uh, uses, I guess, categories. They are treatment, control, and prevention. And uh, the treatment um, typically is, is for a specific animal disease. Uh, control is when there is a expected outbreak whereas prevention is, um, it's kind of a 
we just if nothing's done then 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 there could be a disease outbreak and that's kind of how we evaluate them uh, these are our very key guidances that we use for our evaluation of antimicrobial resistance and uh, they are guidance for industry 152 which was actually most recently updated in 2023 uh, it analyzes the risk of development of resistance among bacteria and human health concern in our own treated food producing animals. And then guidance for industry 159 deals with the impact of antimicrobial residues in edible food products on our human gut and our human intestinal flora. So some of these updates in the most recent GFI 152 include um, a, a updated qualitative risk assessment approach, um, a, uh, it, certainly I'll, I'll get into these shortly, but an updated ranking of the critically important drugs used in human medicine. But the overall goal of this document is to provide a safe use of antimicrobials in food, in, in food animals while ensuring that the uh, significant human therapies are not compromised or lost. We understand that Use of a drug may result in antimicrobial resistance, and, and it certainly will. But will the will that development of resistance actually carry all the way to a human consumer of that meat and and cause a compromised treatment in humans? That's the end uh, result that we have to uh, qual qualitatively address and assess. So. Our qualitative risk assessment always begins with a hazard characterization where we try to characterize the hazard, understand what level of uh, compromised therapy could result. And then, uh, and then we use the uh, hazardous agent that is then characterized as part of that. Uh, we put that through the qualitative risk assessment, which is comprised of release, exposure, and consequence. And then all of this ends up with a risk estimation that is then used to decide what, what if any, risk mitigations are needed um, as part of the drug approval process. So in that initial hazard identification, um, it is defined as the, the hazards identified as the human illness caused by an antimicrobial resistant bacterium that is then attributable to an animal-derived food commodity and then perhaps most importantly and the most difficult to assess is the role that that antimicrobial resistant bacteria may play in compromised treatment for a um, human illness. And in some instances, a hazard characterization alone is sufficient. And oftentimes we do get these um, drugs that are minimally important for human medicine and, and occasionally just a hazard characterization is all that's needed for a um, our pre-approval process. Uh, some foodborne pathogens commonly addressed in these assessments include salmonella, enterica uh, serotypes, campylobacter, enterococcus species, which is used as a kind of our gram positive uh, resistance marker, generic E. coli, which is our Gram negative resistance marker, and then other non foodborne bacterial species can be used uh, occasionally um, as, uh, I, I guess, during our evaluations. And the, the one of the first uh, assessments that we use in our qualitative risk assessment is the release assessment. And this describes factors related to the antimicrobial drug and its use in animals that contribute to the emergence of resistance. So I've highlighted in here um, how NARMS data comes into play here. And it, like I said before, it's, it's critical. Um, obviously, we need to understand the mechanism of activity, the spectrum of activity. So we use the NARMS phenotypic ASD data to determine the spectrum of activity. PKPD information is, is very important for us to have an understanding of the uh, rate and extent of absorption and uh, the interplay with the bacteria, uh, the bacterial pathogens and the um, that, that could pose a threat to humans. Uh, the resistance markers 
obviously through the NCBI database and all of the whole genome sequencing data that we now have access to real time. Uh, we can look up the resistance mechanisms as well as the resistance transfer, the plasma mediated resistance, uh, the selection pressure that Dr. Tate summarized for us nicely. And then perhaps, um, you know, the, the initial, uh, one of the first things that we go to is baseline prevalence and resistance. And that, that type of information is very readily available in the NARMS databases as we just go to um, essentially the, the most recent um, summary data for that NARMS publishes, and we can look at the baseline prevalence and resistance that we know in any given year uh, and temporarily uh, what level of resistance is there for a given uh, bacterial pathogen or foodborne bacterial pathogen and the drug class. And this summarizes essentially what I just said, that the release assessment, this baseline prevalence or resistance is, is arguably our most important. So that's where that phenotypic AST data is critical. We also look at uh, the exposure assessment. So in this, we look at consumption of the commodity, the food commodity, and the prevalence of zoonotic pathogens in that commodity. So within this, we look at the likelihood of human exposure to the foodborne bacteria of human health concern and the per capita consumption of the food commodity. So it, to, de, de, to determine that, we look at uh, USDA food availability data system data, uh, which is published annually. And uh, we can determine you know, how much um, beef is consumed versus goat versus lamb versus uh, chicken and fish. Uh, and virtually every food commodity that uh, we see in our grocery stores. This is kind of an example of our qualitative assessment related to the exposure. And for instance, per capita consumption of the food commodity. So for beef, beef is a very high food uh, per capita consumption um, and the probability of food commodity contamination. So we look at the norms contamination rates for, say, E. coli or Campylobacter, and I think Campylobacter is quite low, so for beef and Campylobacter, it would end up being a low per capita consumption, or I'm sorry, a low exposure assessment category if, if the Campylobacter was the um, primary hazard that we are evaluating in that instance. And Second, and thirdly, we also look at the consequence assessment. So the consequence assessment, which is found in GFI 152 Appendix A primarily, uh, it describes human health consequence of the exposure to the resistant bacteria. And it's based on the importance of the drug or, the, or its class to humans. And it qualitatively ranks with that drug class um, in, in we developed this Appendix A ranking uh, in conjunction with our human counterparts in FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research uh, using their human medicine expertise. And within the consequence assessment, we um, came down to three um, rankings of these medically important drugs, the critically important, highly important, and important. And uh, I'm not going to get into too much here with, with regard to specific rankings, but uh, the they're based on three criteria. Essentially, is that is the drug class one of sole or uh, uh, a drug class that is the sole or one of limited available therapies to treat serious bacterial infections in humans, or is it not one of those? And then in the third category, it's it may be a drug that's used to treat only non-serious bacterial infections, and there's lots of other options available to them. So the, the, those criteria are used to determine the critically important, highly important, or uh, important categories. And these are some of the examples of the critically important antimicrobial drug classes. So, for instance, macrolides, fluoroquinolones like cyprofloxacin, anaphloxacin, cephalosporins, and the, um, and the amino glycosides are all critically important. Highly important are the penicillins, lincosamides, phenicols, 
um, in the oxytetracycline. Uh, and the important category are the sulfonamides, including the potentiated sulfonamides and uh, first generation cephalosporin. And this is just an example from our, our newest updated table A1 in the GFI 152. And these red arrows correspond to a, after the, since 2003, we have increased these rankings um, at least one level from say important to high or high to critically important. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit of a, a summary snapshot of uh, where we are with some of these drug classes as a agency. So like I said, the release assessment, the exposure assessment, and the consequence, consequence assessment are all used to um, eventually get us to a risk estimation, which is um, used to produce an overall measure of the risk associated with the hazards. And using that risk estimation, which on this, it's a category three if it's low, category two if it's medium, and category one if it's high. And basically, if it's a high, generally, we like to have a marketing status that's going to be prescription only or potentially BFD, which is the veterinary feed directive, which is still under the auspices of a, of a veterinarian. Um, and in some instances, we may have extra label use prohibitions put on a label. Um, extent of use limitations is a very important thing that we do um, for some drug classes where a uh, you know it's going to be used in an entire farm and it's a important, highly important or critically important drug class. We will oftentimes put an extent of use limitation. For for example, uh, limiting in the indication, doing the best we can to limit the use to animals that have already been that that are diagnosed with the disease or or limiting to only the the group of animals say a building or a pen of animals that are um, showing clinical signs of the disease rather than allowing uh, treatment of the entire farm even if some of them are not actually showing um, clinical signs and then when we're talking about NARMS we will in most instances um, have that drug class that's, that's being evaluated and eventually approved incorporated into our NARMS uh, monitoring program to make sure that we can detect emerging resistance um, after the drug goes on the market. So this is one, this is an example where you know, having our um, phenotypic uh, AST you know, monitoring as well as the whole genome sequencing analyses can really help us in detecting those emerging resistances. Those of us on our team right now, we have uh, five members on the team. Um, we have, uh, we're regularly involved in AMR related activities with JECFA, VICH, TADFAR, the OIE, WHO group uh, that, that uh, task forces on AMR, the Global One Health Academy, um, myself and uh, my colleague Steve Yan are heavily involved in CLSI work, developing diagnostic tools to um, improve diagnosis of diseases in animals and um, and make clinical choices based on those um, amicodous susceptibility testing uh, results as much as possible, uh, as well as uh, Codex International work. So. so in conclusion, our qualitative risk assessments aid in science-based decision-making for new animal drug approvals to preserve and protect human health. Uh, we use existing surveillance system and research data like those of NARMS. Um, we use that data um, primarily in that, that baseline prevalence and resistance data category, and certainly in the, the, the new highly powerful um, whole genome sequencing data. We also do use uh, publicly available literature studies and studies and not just NARMS data, but uh, you know our Canadian counterparts and uh, and European colleagues. They publish uh, you know similar surveillance data that, that we do use on occasion as well. 
Um, and then sometimes sponsors will voluntarily conduct studies uh, to address some of our concerns. So um, that, that data certainly is useful as well. Um, but we, uh, we do attempt to the, to the best of our ability to mitigate these risks by limiting extra label uses, requiring oversight by a veterinarian, and modifying the delivery method and or extending the withdrawal periods uh, to uh, minimize the, the, the resistance emergence. And I'm going to skip over these this last slide. And this is our team comprised of uh, Sylvia Pinedo, Heather Harbottle, myself, Ruby Singh. Uh, the blue arrows pointed out are recently retired team leader. Uh, Jeff Gilbert and uh, and Steve Miller. I'll pause there and hopefully we have some questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Miller, and thank you, Dr. Tate, as well for this really great session. I, if you guys have about five minutes, I might pull in a couple questions for you both. I know we're a couple minutes over, but what do you uh, do? You guys are you available, Heather and Ron, for a couple minutes? Sure. Yes. Great. So just a reminder to the audience, if you want to pop a, a question or two in the chat for Dr. Tate or Dr. Miller, please feel free to do so. I do have a, a couple that came my way. So I'll ask you actually the first question for Dr. Tate. You were mentioning uh, whole genome sequencing and we're wondering, there, the question is how many sequences or samples on average per year uh, do you think are analyzed for AMR and is that all done through NARMS separately than public health labs? Uh, that's a good question. I um, I don't. I would have to do the math in my head, uh, which I can't do at the moment. But <laughs> but we're getting we're collecting about um, forty samples a month of meat from each of our from each of our participating laboratories, and then you know if something is positive for a Salmonella, E. coli. Um, or Campylobacter, whole genome sequencing is conducted on that. We don't do whole genome sequencing right now for Enterococcus, or at least not not many Enterococcus. Um, and then for the 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 human part, a lot of that is done through PulseNet. Um, so the the a lot all of the all of the public health laboratories are members of PulseNet, and so um, you know they've shifted from PFGE now to to whole genome sequencing for the past couple years. So all all ill person uh, bacteria um, whole genome sequences are getting uploaded through the PulseNet mechanism, and that of course is dependent on who's getting sick, how many people are getting sick, et, et cetera. That's great. No, that answer is perfect. Thank you. And I think one other question for you actually on that topic, I think you mentioned collaborations with EPA. Um, it looked, I'm just re referencing your, your, your slide previously, but um, does EPA have a separate sampling program or they look to you and then help with the data uh, display they, and analysis? They have a separate sampling program. So um, the, like I said, their NURSA study or National Rivers and Streams Assessment, that's been in existence for many years. Um, and so we're just, we've partnered with them sort of leveraging that for antimicrobial resistance monitoring purposes. Um, so sort of expanding the testing that's done for that study. And then the watershed studies, there, there are um, individual um, principal investigators at EPA that have watershed studies that they're doing. Um, and so this one was actually currently, it was already established before we even started working with EPA. Um, and so uh, just leveraging what they already have. Wonderful. No, that's great. Thank you. And then I have one final question, and this one is for Dr. Miller. Um, and it kind of, I think, actually tags right off some of your last slides. So what are some of the key enforcement considerations for implementing AMR surveillance programs in the fishing and aquaculture industry? And how can those be harmonized or coordinated across international borders? That's a big question. <laughs> the, the harmonizing across international borders, that's a little bit outside my um specialization and so forth. So I wouldn't be able to touch on that. But we do, you know, we do consider consumption in of fish and the uh, and the contamination rate of fish products. And and uh you know NARMS is as in the past five or ten years 
really started to look at um, contamination rates of domestically reared uh, aquacultured fish compared to international, you know, uh, imported. Um, and I believe it's they found that by and large the domestically reared species and samples are have pretty darn low contamination rates. So we we consider that in our in our evaluations. Um, in, so with very, very low to negligible contamination rates of U.S. aquaculture products, um, you know, the, the risk to the human consumer is considerably lower than we would, might think from an imported Southeast Asian uh, fish product, for example. So um, it's all qualitative, uh, as I was saying. So we, we do... And, I, I was co-author on a, on a FAO um, regional guideline dealing with antimicrobial resistance. And in it, we discussed that and um, discussed the international uh, regulatory needs of um, considering antimicrobial resistance and um, to kind of alert our, our Asian counterparts on the regulatory side that uh, they should really look at the um, contamination rates and, and factor that into their regulatory decisions because there's a lot of antimicrobials that are approved overseas. A lot of scary drugs are, that are used and approved, um, unfortunately. So uh, hopefully that guideline and, and some of the other publications that are that are going out soon will help um, curb some of those uses. That's a great answer. No, thank you so much. You so much expertise here with both these speakers. So just want to thank you again, Dr. Tate and Dr. Miller, for joining us today and on this topic. Really appreciate your support um, on this. And I hope everyone in the audience found that very interesting as well. Uh, without further ado, I am going to move on to our second session topic. So we'll be speaking, we covered antimicrobial resistance. Now we're kind of moving over to a chemistry related topic. So um, our second session today is regulatory and industry challenges, PFAS in food, beverage, and consumer products. So just a background on this session. This was identified for those who weren't on earlier. This session was identified as a topic of interest by our committee members. Uh, we have a series of speakers who will discuss some ongoing challenges with PFAS, both from regulatory and global industry perspectives. Uh, the speakers will discuss analysis and sampling challenges for regulatory applications, as well as some practical um, development for consumer safety globally. There's some great expertise today that cover a lot of different areas um, from the regulatory to the industry to the consumer side. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. I think I see her on the line, Susie Ginaldi. So Dr. Ginaldi, um, if you're ready to speak, I can do a quick introduction for you. Um, it's going to be a, it looks like you're sharing your screen. Perfect. So Dr. Ginaldi is currently a research chemist in the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the FDA. Her research over the last 13 years has focused on developing methods for the analysis of direct and indirect food additives in food and food packaging. And for the last seven years has focused on PFAS analysis in foods. Prior to her work at FDA, she received her PhD in analytical chemistry at the Oregon State University and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Environment Canada. I also would like to give a shout out to her because she does a lot of amazing work with AOAC for those who are familiar mm -hmm. uh, in the PFAS space. So thank you so much, Susie, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for that great introduction. Um, can you see everything okay? Yes, we can. I can hear it great too. All right, perfect. Yeah, so today I'm going to discuss some of the work that we've been doing here at the FDA in looking at challenges and sampling analysis uh, for the main purpose of regulating PFAS in food. And I do want to mention this is a big collaborative effort between many people at CIFSAN, uh, so there's many co-authors here that have been part of this work. So just a brief introduction, how PFAS get into food. So the work that we're mainly focused on is through environmental contamination. So we know that they can come from the aquatic environment, either from landfill leachate, effluents from floral chemical plants, wastewater treatment plants. A lot of times reclaimed water from these plants will be applied to agricultural fields. Same thing with biosolids from wastewater treatment plants applied back to agricultural fields, and then they can then impact crops grown on those fields and also livestock that consume those crops. Uh, we've also seen sources from aqueous film forming foam, which can result in contaminating groundwater, which again, if these livestock consume this groundwater, they then become contaminated and also agricultural uh, products that are fed this groundwater. 
So there are a few guidelines that have come out in Europe in the last couple of years looking at regulations for PFAS in foods. So I just wanted to go over a few of those. In 2020 is when EFSA first came out with the scientific opinion that these four PFAS, which I call the priority PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, PFNA, and PFHXS, um, they established a group tolerable weekly intake for the sum of these compounds. Then in March of 2022, the European Reference Laboratory, along with the National Reference Labs in Europe, came out with a really nice guidance document, which has a lot of information on what analytes you should be looking at if you're looking at PFAS and food and feed, also what your validation parameters should be and your LOQ should be. Um, after this document was released, then later that summer in August of 2022, uh, the EU came out with monitoring guidelines and LOQs, and they wanted uh, the EU to start monitoring PFAS in foods starting in the year 2022 and at least going until 2025. And then in December of 22 uh, was the first time that any levels have really been set um, at a a government level for PFAS and food. And this was for, again, these four PFAS, these four party PFAS, PFAS, PFOA, PFHXS, and PFNA. And it was in certain certain foods, which I'll go into detail a little bit later. Um, and I do want to mention that the main reason it's these four is these are ones that at the time of this um, are the ones that we're able to do health assessments on. So if we find them in food, we are able to do a health assessment and determine, you know, using their tox reference values, what the risk is uh, for consumption. Uh, and then in 2023, AOAC came out with, uh, or started a working group in the beginning of 2023, uh, developing an SMPR. So AOAC is an international organization. And this SMPR relied heavily on a lot of the EU guidance documents. Um, as, as it is international, it did contain members from both Europe and the US and other parts of the world. And the the whole goal of this SMPR is to create these requirements for people who are developing methods and what parameters that they should follow in order to have you know, good sound methods. And this SMPR final version was approved in 2023 with a final a call for methods in December of 2023. And so with this goal is that there will be more methods available for PFAS and foods coming from um, different agencies or different um, industry partners. And so as a result of this work coming from Europe, both in 2022, and then again, this SMPR in 2023, at the FDA, we started evaluating our current method that we were using for meeting these SMPR guidelines. And I want to start off with you know, a few of the sampling challenges that came about initially with these new AOAC and EU guidelines that didn't work quite well with our current method. Uh, the required LOQs for milk and produce samples was is 10 ppt, and this was initially set by Europe. They have them listed as indicative levels, so they're not levels that they're taking regulatory action on, but they are what they would like people to be able to see in their methods. So 10 ppt for milk and produce, and then two short chain PFAS, PFBA, and PFPEA we know can be really challenging. And the, because in a triple quad instrument, which most people are using, they only produce one fragment. And so they do require a secondary confirmation technique. And this resulted, uh, this was included in both the EU guidance and the AOAC. And this is important because we have seen a lot of false or positive reports of both of these analytes. And this is to help kind of uh, alleviate that and be able to say that if we are finding these, that we are confident that it really is those analytes and not uh, some other interference. Uh, another issue was cholic acids. Again, this is written both in the EU and AOAC guidance, is that these can also cause false positives. And we've seen this over and over again. We've seen it with contract labs. We've seen it in our lab. We've seen it in other labs as well. And these are acids that are present in the animal, such as uh, the most common are eggs, liver, and fish samples. And they co-elute with the main analyte PFOS. And so if you don't have them resolved chromatographically or you don't have a separate step to remove them, they can also, again, result in false positive PFOS. So you might not actually be detecting PFOS, you might be detecting you know, this cholic acid. Uh, and then method blanks is a huge problem with this analysis. Uh, it varies day by day. It can vary from solvent batch to, you know, you can open up a new solvent bottle and you can all of a sudden have a contamination.
Sally, did we lose Dr. Ginaldi? Yes, I think we may have lost Dr. Ginaldi. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> we'll see okay. if she logs back in. And I'll shoot her a message. So just a reminder to folks, feel free to pop questions in the chat for our speakers. We'll do a um, Q&A afterwards. So just hang tight for one minute while we see if uh, Dr. Ginaldi gets back on. So I'm not hearing, um, Latanya, I'm not hearing from her. So I don't know if we want to take uh, about one more minute or two, and then we can, I don't know if Jared um, or Taylor would like to, I guess, Jared, you're our next speaker. So I don't know if that's, sure. we'd be ready to take over if she needs some time to log back in. Yeah, no problem. Wonderful. Okay. Let me just give her about another minute and then we'll, we'll probably just for the sake of time, adopt over to you. That's good. I know we were recently having some VPN issues, so. Oh, looks like she's, uh, looks like she's back. <laughs> sure. I think you're on mute, Susie. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. My uh, VPN got disconnected. Um, okay. And like you might turn off your video while presenting that will help with the bandwidth issue. Okay. All right. Um, is everyone can see everything okay? Yep, looks good to me. Thank okay. you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, so just to kind of start over from this slide, the timeline of N local methods, we started in 2019 with a single lab uh, validation and of 16 analytes. And then in 2021, we modified this method to incorporate processed foods. And then 2022 extended to 20 analytes to incorporate additional analytes for our seafood survey. And then we did a matrix extension for animal feed as this required some modifications for that matrix. And then after the EU document, we started to extend our method to 30 analytes. And then in 2023, we had to make some more adjustments uh, to lower our LOQ for certain matrix categories. This was again to meet these AOAC uh, guidances. That's our way. There we go. Um, and so, uh, so again, this LOQ challenge, the AOAC required LOQs uh, are listed here in this table for these, again, these four priority categories. Again, these are ones which there are regulatory requirements um, in Europe. So these are egg, seafood, fish, meat, and meat of terrestrial animals, and then edible offal. So the LOQs are listed here from 0.3 to 0.1 to 0.4. And our LOQs from the SLV we had performed in 2022 were all able to meet those LOQs. At this time, we had not tested offal. Uh, but then we went to look at the other categories of matrices we tested in our SLV. The produce and milk were not able to meet the LOQs of this 10 PPT. So we realized we needed to make some more modifications here with this method. Um, and at the time we had not tested some of these additional matrices required by AOAC, coffee, dairy powders, fish oil, and baby food. And at the time we had tested feed and silage and corn samples and those passed as, passed as well. So we wanted to see if we we're able to adjust our current method to be able to meet these lower LOQs for AOAC validation. So this is our FDA method. It's a catcher's extraction followed by an SPE cleanup. And there's two areas where we can make 
modifications to the method where we can add an extra concentration step, which will help us get to those lower LOQs for the milk and the produce samples. So after the catchers, instead of taking one mil of the catcher's extract and performing SPE, we took five mils, concentrated to one mil, and then did our SPE. And then instead of blowing down to one mil of extract, we blow, blew down to half a mil. Um, and this worked because milk and produce are pretty simple matrices. It probably wouldn't work on some of the more complex ones, um, but we were able to get good results by adding these two extra steps in our method to reach these validations. Uh, and just to kind of show an example, Again, the required LOQ is 10 PPT. This is uh, what they call a lowest spiked validated level. So you spike this, the matrix and do your extraction. You wanna be able to see your quant I and your qual I, and you want everything to be able to meet certain validation parameters. So for those for PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS, and PFNA, here's the chromatograms of the 10 PPT spikes. And we can see that they all, we are able to confirm them and we see a good enough abundance that we feel confident that this uh, is a measurable LOQ for these matrices. So now after we continue the AOAC validation with our new modifications for the produce and milk, we're able to meet these really low LOQs. And then we continue to look at these other matrices that were not included in our original SLV, and we're able to meet the LOQs required for those as well. So we're now able to get all of them to pass uh, for with our modified, including our modified method. And, and like I mentioned before, for PFBA and PFPEA, we need confirmation using high-res mass spectrometry. This is how you know, we chose to do it in our laboratory. So again, these only have one MRM transition during low resolution mass spec. So uh, we've seen a lot of false positives reported of these, a lot of interferences. So for the validation for the AOAC, we looked at the spikes and we looked at them in using our high-res mass spec instrument. And again, this looks at the exact mass of these analytes. So we're looking at them to four decimal places. We are very confident that this is the compound and we wanted to be sure we could validate it on the high-res because any detects of these, we will be analyzing using high-res and not our low-res instrument. And just to kind of show an example of what this looks like chromatographically. So corn tends to be one of our dirtiest samples we get. And you'll see in this early, so PFB and PFPA are in the very early part of the chromatogram. And they, you see a bunch of other peaks that you can see in the blue, this is the PFBA. There's a bunch of other peaks there and background and definitely an elevated background. Uh, when you look at it on the triple quad, so you don't really feel confident using these results. But then when you look at on the right-hand side, it's the results from the high-res mass spec. Again, we're looking at this exact mass transition. So there is no background and you're really looking at just that analyte. So um, this is, you just feel a lot more confidence in these results. Uh, and so as I mentioned, cholic acids are bile acids, which can be present in certain food samples. And the issue is that their mass is the same as PFOS. So they, it interferes with the PFOS ion. And so in both the EU and the AOAC guidance, you need to separate them out or you must have a removal technique. And so in our current method, um, in this chromatogram here, you can see blue is PFOS. And then the cholic acids, uh, we see green is TCDCA and orange is TDCA. And again, there are three isomers. You need to make sure you're looking for all of them. TUDCA TU comes out. Uh, before 16 minutes, so we don't actually see that one. So even though TDCA is not a problem in our method, TCDCA is, so we needed to have a separate technique to be able to remove that. So in samples that we were that we measured both PFOS and TCDCA, we took a portion of the catcher's extract, we passed it through a, a carbon cartridge, MV carb cartridge, and this removes the cholic acids, and then we concentrate it, and then we bring it back up and we rerun it. And so on the left side is an example of the egg sample. This is an egg sample spiked with PFOS, and uh, the TDCA or the TCDCA is the green and the blue big peak in the middle. But then the, um, once it's removed on the right-hand side, you can see that now we're only seeing the PFOS. So it was creating this false positive with this big blue peak that you might think was PFOS if you didn't know what you were looking for. Uh, and then I just want to spend uh, one last slide on the method blank challenges. So, you know, a method blank is when a blank matrix, in our case, we use water, is taken through the entire analytical procedure and evaluated for PFOS. PFAS concentrations that can result from background. So this is, you know, not coming from the sample itself, but coming from, you know, your 
equipment, your centrifuge tubes, your pipette tips, um, any solvents you're using, even your lab bay, the equipment you're using. And so this is a, a summary of 100 method blanks that were done, run during 2023 over um, a batch of many samples. And as you can see, it just it is very variable. So if PFBA is the one that we have the most challenge with. Um, some days we will see, you know, one person can run at their bay and they can have no PFBA contamination, the next day, um, you know, it can, it can jump up. So uh, this is just something that we really monitor and we keep an eye on, especially when doing our validation work, because these blanks need to fall, you know, below a certain amount when doing spike and recovery calculations. And, and then you can see, we also have issues with PFPEA, PFHXA and PFOA. It's probably the least, but we do see little spikes at PFOA at certain points. And again, this is just something you really need to be you know, looking out for. So again, you aren't reporting background lab contamination as you know, being found in food samples. So just in summary, the both the AOAC, SMPR, and the ERL guidance documents, which just both came about in the last couple of years, in 2022 and 2023, uh, are great tools for method developers of PFAS and foods methods and for setting the stage for developing methods that meet regulatory requirements. And again, they both address these analytical challenges, which I've spoken about today, this PFBA, PFPA confirmation, and these cholic acid interferences. Um, and then just to reiterate that method blanks are you know, very important and need to be uh, routinely monitor to ensure accurate results and resolve any contaminant contamination issues that may arise. Because um, like I mentioned, you could have open up a new solvent bottle and have a problem and you just really need to be able to, to monitor that and resolve that issue as quickly as possible to just not slow the lab down. So thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Susie. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, so insightful and great to have a regulatory perspective. Um, a reminder to folks in the chat, we'll have a, a full Q&A session at the end of all of our speaker sessions. So if you have any questions for Susie or any of other speakers, just pop it in the chat. We'll be sure to cover. Um, and you're okay to stay on for a little bit um, through other speakers, Susie? For yep, that's, those yep, questions. that's fine. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, well then I'm gonna to transition to our next speaker, uh, Jared, if Jared's ready, I'll give a quick intro for him. Um, so thumbs up maybe Jared, if you're ready, I can give yep. you an intro. Great, yep, thank you, thank you. Um, so Jared Rothstein, he's the Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Consumer Brands Association, uh, the trade association representing the consumer packaged goods industry. Jared serves as a subject matter expert on chemicals management related regulatory and policy matters impacting food, beverage, personal care and household products. Prior to joining Consumer Brands, Jared was engaged in regulatory matters impacting the specialty chemical manufacturing industry, including implementation of the 2016 amendments of the Toxic Substance Control Act, so Tusca, as well as air, water, and waste regulations under other environmental statutes administered by the EPA. So we're really excited to transition over from, uh, we have a regulatory representative with Susie, now we're transitioning more into consumer and industry, and uh, Jared can talk a little bit more about how these regulations impact those fields. So thank you, Jared. Uh, feel free to take it away. Great. Thanks so much. I see everyone can hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you great. Great. Uh, thanks. So, um, yeah, I'll be providing an overview um, of the PFAS policy landscape, a little more high level than the uh, prior presentation, more kind of like the legal, uh, regulatory, and uh, you know, just a like, kind of overview of some of the policy issues that are uh, going on at, uh, domestically. So with that, um, as mentioned, uh, Consumer Brands represents the consumer packaged goods industry, uh, food, beverage, personal care, and household products, and their uh, subsidiary brands, uh, many of which you might recognize uh, you see at the grocery store aisle. Uh, moving along, uh, in terms of the, our activities and on PFAS, uh, Consumer Brands is focused in a few key areas. Uh, we are trying to provide policy intelligence on PFAS requirements to our members. Uh, we do a lot of uh, monitoring and tracking of legislation and, regu and regulation that's emerging at the state and federal level, uh, facilitate engagement with the agencies and lawmakers and NGOs on the science and uh, regulatory issues surrounding the management of PFAS. Uh, we do uh, are heavily focused on mitigation of state patchwork. So there is, as I've been into, an emerging um, just landscape where state requirements around P PFAS are um, varied and becoming more and more difficult and challenging for, for brands to be able to manage uh, because of the variations in those types of requirements. And um, we've also established a set of policy principles and strategy for that purpose. So uh, with that, 
um, just to give everyone just a very high level overview of how we, um, the CPG industry, think about PFAS for our members and their and um, their segment. Uh, in, in one space, it's a packaging issue, um, as you all as you all know, uh, PFAS uh, compounds can be used intentionally uh, for for as a barrier in packaging for oil and water repellency. Um, they're also often used as a processing agent, uh, either to lubricate equipment. They also are used to, as a mold release agent for packaging that's manufactured, and they go and it, it can be go. It can go as far back in the supply chain as uh, the pellets uh, you know, for, that are used to, to mold packaging uh, in the supply chain. So there are a lot of potential sources of PFAS in the packaging space, um, going back, um, I think, multiple layers in the supply chain. And of course, there is the potential issue of contamination. Um, the most, um, I think, notable one to mention is potential contamination as a result of post-consumer recycled content. So if there's PFAS in your packaging and then it makes its way in the recycling stream, it can then move into you know other other materials potentially. So on the product side, um, there are intentional uses of PFAS as well, potentially in the CPG space. So we do see it occasionally as a surfactant in service and fa fabric treatments and cleaners. Um, it's also been identified as a use in cosmetics uh, to basically provide functionality uh, for smudge proofing or waterproofing types of uh, cosmetic uh, products. And then we also uh, can see in certain instances that based on the chemical structure, uh, drugs can sometimes be considered PFAS chemicals, uh, depending on the definition that you use for, for, for PFAS. Um, in the states, it's, it's fairly broad. Uh, states use a definition where there has to be at least one fully fluorinated carbon atom. And um, there's quite a significant number of drugs that might fall into that category as well. And of course, there are also potentially the issues around contamination of products, and that might be as a result of migration from the packaging into the product or potential sourcing issues uh, for the supply chain as well, potentially. So um, in terms of where, what we're seeing at the state level, as I mentioned, um, food packaging has, has been in the crosshairs for quite a while. Um, currently, there are 12 states that have implemented prohibitions of some form uh, for food packaging and PFAS. Um, the, the compliance dates vary. Some of them went into effect in 2023. Um, they scale up all the way into 2025 currently. Um, I should note as well that the what is in scope uh, in some in these state laws varies as well. Um, some of the states define food packaging as being paper-based, paper or fiber-based packaging being ex explicitly prohibited for having from having PFAS, other states are shifting over to defining it as direct food con direct contact uh, food food packaging. So it's using a bit of a broader definition there. Some states focus on both primary, tertiary, and secondary packaging, while others don't necessarily define that. So this has already been a significant industry challenge uh, because of the varying definitions and uh, compliance scale scale ups that we're seeing currently. More broadly, uh, we're also seeing uh, phase outs quite coming into effect at the state level for other types of product categories. A lot of the state laws basically do, um, I would say, a bit of a laundry list of specifying different types of products. Um, we're, in our space, we're seeing cleaning products, cosmetic and personal care products, menstrual products, cookware, dental floss uh, being specified. Um, states go broader than this. I should I should note um, they usually specify apparel, uh, fabric treatments, and so forth. So it, it's it's much broader than these few categories, but these are the ones that are relevant to to our members. Um, there also is an emerging effort in some states to to ban all non essential uses of PFAS in products. Uh, the states of Maine and Minnesota have gone down this route, and generally they're using a definition that uh, non-essential means product, uh, products that are not necessary for health, safety, or the functioning of society, um, and they are leaving it up to the state regulatory departments to necessarily define what that means. Um, typically, we've also seen in, in some of these states an effort to exempt drugs and medical devices as um as essential uses, so they wouldn't necessarily have to uh, go through a regulatory process and get exemptions separately, um, out of concern of the you know impacts to you know uh, you know uh, people's you know medical needs. And then we're also seeing uh, an emerging effort to require reporting for PFAS and products as well at the state level. Uh, currently, Maine and Minnesota are two states that have established these types of requirements. Um, they're slightly different, different compliance timeframes, 
and different scopes. Um, main is only focused on products um, where there are unavoidable uses, and Minnesota is going to require essentially all products that are sold or offered or manufactured in the state to be um, have reporting. And as you can see on the on the right. Um, there's an ample amount of information required to be reported, including um, the SKUs, the cast numbers for the PFAS, uh, the amount of PFAS used, uh, whether it's the exact amount or in a range, um, and any other types of other necessary information that might that regulators might need. Uh, I should note that um, it is specific to the product and all of its components, so this could get uh, very complicated depending on uh, if you have a multi-component product. Um, you, you can think of things like vehicles um, or electronics where you might have one small component that might have PFAS used for a very specific functional purpose. That is all in scope uh, and manufacturers are going to be required to essentially like work through their supply chains to figure out where it might be and then be able to report it in those uh, in those amounts. So that is also an emerging uh, uh, source of compliance uh, just difficulty as you can imagine for for our members as well as other other industries and in, in these states and we're seeing it uh be proposed in a few other states in the most recent uh state legislative uh, cycle in 2024. There's quite a bit of agency activity. I won't, I won't dive too deep. This is just a brief summary of what we're seeing um, at EPA, FDA, and USDA. Um, EPA, of course, has been very active uh, addressing primarily, I would say, PFAS as a source of contamination. Um, they most recently just issued their drinking water um, regulation for, for six PFAS and set those levels very low in the parts per trillion. Um, they've also established some hazardous substance declarations under the Superfund statute for PFOA and PFOS, and so that's going to expand um, cleanup requirements for certain PFAS. Um, as, as you're in the prior presentation, FDA is doing a significant amount of work around sampling and method development as well, um, and, and they've also been looking at uh, PFAS uh, uses in uh, food contact applications and narrowing the scope of um, potential uses in that space as well. And then USDA is doing quite a bit of work around the sampling and surveillance space and um, research as well. And then just briefly on the product litigation side, we are seeing all of these regulatory and legal um, efforts in the policy space bleed over and have impacts in the litigation space since um, you know, we're able to test PFAS at such low levels and there's a general consensus around you know, risk and safety. So we are seeing um, litigation pop up under three primary categories, under Prop 65 uh, in California, under, under failure to warn. Um, we're also seeing cases around environmental personal injury and then claims and consumer deception. So I'd say um, the, the primary products we've seen suits uh, arise is primarily in the cosmetics, menstrual products, um, fast food packaging, um, and then some different types of uh, food products as well, where we've seen uh, a lot of class action litigation start to start to get filed against companies. Um, primarily what we're seeing is ma mainly the consumer deception space for our, for our sector. Uh, where basically you know, companies may have labeling on their products saying that their products are natural or that they're safe and so forth. They might have green, you know, green claims essentially, um, but because you know you, uh, PFAS is ubiquitous and maybe be able to be detected in certain products, you could think of juice product. Um, you know there there may be PFAS in the parts per trillion because of the the water sourcing for that product. Um, so these cases are alleging essentially that these products are not safe. Uh, because of that um, non-intentional presence of PFAS, and therefore the, the companies are deceiving consumers uh, about their products. Um, most of these cases are, are pretty early in, the, in, the, in their stages, and we haven't really seen how things will pan out yet um, in terms of settlements or, or judgments about these cases and whether or not they have merit. Uh, but that is a significant um, just risk for, for CPG companies that are navigating the, the PFAS space currently. So where we are now um, for consumer brands, um, our primary objectives are, I think, threefold, which is to minimize state-by-state -state patchwork. Uh, as I mentioned, the, it's, a, it's becoming very, very unworkable for large companies that are navigating a national marketplace. Um, they are looking for uh, to, to better harmonize across the states that do have requirements and ensure that there's um, a process for transitioning out of intentional uses that are currently permitted. Um, we are looking for more um, science in this in this space as well. 
a lot of the decisions being made are not looking at um, PFAS that have a demonstrated risk to public health. There, it's being very, it's a very categorical approach to risk management currently, and that's a big, uh, a, a significant concern for for our members. And then we are looking for more federal action uh, from key agencies, including FDA, and EPA, and others, to ensure that um, you know we're, we're seeing risk management and risk communication being deployed, and that we're seeing more test method development and more science and research, as well as in the space, because it's so, so complex. Um, I think that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Uh, at the end, <laughs> is there a call? So. Thank you so thank you so much, Jared. That was a really yeah. insightful talk and a really great overview. Um, Brent, so yeah, so folks, reminder, if you have any questions for Jared or for Susie, feel free to pop them in the chat. We already have some great questions coming our way, so looking forward to that. Um, I am going to go ahead and move on to our last speaker, and then we'll get a chance to have those questions answered. So our next speaker is Taylor Reynolds. Um, he is the PFAS Working Group Lead and the North American Senior Commercial Marketing Manager covering environmental testing and battery industries. Taylor has been with Millipore Sigma for eight years in various roles. In 2020, he started leading an internal working group to address these PFAS analytical needs for customers. As the head of the Millis Per Sigma Working Group, Taylor works with both internal and external partners developing application notes, new products, and gathering customer feedback and needs to promote consumer safety. So I want to thank you, Taylor, for joining us today. And also, uh, I will point out that he's he's joining us from his own vacation. So he's taking some nice time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it, Taylor. It's my pleasure, Sally. Thank you for having me. And, and um, as you mentioned, I am on vacation and our Wi-Fi is a little bit spotty because we're in the middle of a thunderstorm. Uh, so I'm going to keep my camera off. I hope nobody takes offense to that. Um, but uh, I feel like Susie and Jared have done a phenomenal job of providing uh, some background information. And, and quite a few of the slides that I have to share today are going to be um, there's going to be quite a bit of overlap, so I'm going to just go ahead and save everybody some time. And as we hit those points, I'll gloss over it and we'll uh, get through this a little bit faster. So uh, we've had the fantastic input from the, the consumer group and the uh, methods development group at AOAC. Uh, to, I hope to share maybe just a little bit of insight from a manufacturer's perspective. Um, to jump in and let me know if this advance is okay for you. Um, Millipore Merck KGAA, uh, meaning uh, here in North America, we have to use the name Millipore Sigma, but in the rest of the world, we go by the name Merck KGAA, and I sometimes use the name different aspects of, of the industry and and for the, the food and bev industry we kind of have a, a dual role as both a supplier of raw ingredients and materials from our flavors and fragrances division as well as a, a supplier and provider of consumables and analytical supplies for laboratory testing um, so Everything that I, I present is going to kind of have that dual perspective as, as we talk today. And we're we're here to talk about how PFOS is, is affecting everybody from the consumers. It's causing all kinds of heartache for government authorities that have to come up with regulations and approved methods and, and everything. And then those of us that are industrial suppliers or producers, we have to walk that balance of providing products that meet the needs of our customers while at the same time, as, as Jared so rightly pointed out, um, dealing with the long-term potential liability issues. And I think that's one of the biggest um, components of the topic of PFAS. This, I mean, I, I, I personally feel like this is a topic that is, is going to be a focal area for discussion well past the time that I retire and I don't consider myself anywhere near to that point. So, so PFAS is affecting everybody. It's, it's causing a lot of heartache everywhere. And um, 
we at, at Millipore Sigma are, are constantly trying to find ways that we can support those that are trying to develop solutions uh, at, at multiple stages within this dynamic and, and matrix. Um, so again, this is some areas where we can we can skip a little bit or, or breeze through it. In terms of the, the regulations that are driving our concern, um, here I've got at a global level, some of the, the European and, and South American resolutions that have come up and are, are on the horizon. Um, I've had a fair number of conversations with people in Latin America where they are, for the most part, uh, taking inspiration and following the lead of North America, but some areas are, are trying to be a little bit more proactive, working on their own types of activities. Uh, the Europe is definitely um, being more proactive in their efforts to regulate, but their most recent activities have kind of hit a little bit of a roadblock in that they had a massive amount of negative industrial feedback on the uh, proposed legislation. So things are still in flux around the globe. And, and it's somewhat true here in North America. Uh, we have had some pretty significant regulatory, I don't want to say wins, because it's not necessarily a, a win-loss type of scenario, but it is it is definitely a significant milestone. The EPA recently uh, published their most or their final Safe Drinking Water Act uh, regulations for PFAS for the six compounds that they were able to uh, include. Uh, there have been numerous activities from the FDA, the USDA. I've seen articles published by the USGS, CDC. Lots of different federal organizations are looking at PFAS and coming up with guidelines, regulations, standardizations, and other informative and guideline type activities to help individuals, consumers, manufacturers navigate this some fairly complex issue. Uh, again, this is, I think Jared's slides were a, a much more visual representation of this slide in terms of identifying the states that have started to introduce PFAS regulations. I have been simultaneously impressed and appalled by some of the state regulations. I think the intent and the objectives of some of these re regulations are very well intentioned and laudable. I think the execution and the wording of some of the regulations are problematic to say the least. So at a state level, as Jared said, the are, are very complex, sometimes requiring different interpretations depending on who you're talking to. And that's an issue. But at, at its most fundamental, I think for us, Millipore Sigma, it's a little bit easier when we reframe the conversation into the context of analysis, testing, right? Get down to the science, it's a lot easier to be more cohesive and universal. And so that's the, the area that I get to work in where uh, I don't have to worry so much about the political and the and the legalese of the regulations. When it comes to testing, uh, the workflow for PFAS analysis, when you are in, when you're talking about discrete analysis, and when I say discrete, I mean testing for specific analytes follows this basic functionality. You have to collect the sample in some way, shape or form. Generally speaking, there is some amount of sample preparation involved and, and Sally shared that with us in her AOAC work. You, again, Sally talked about the, the method blanks and the standardization and using reference standards to calibrate your instrumentation. And then you have to do the analysis, which for the most part is done using liquid chromatography. I am seeing more methods being developed outside of the liquid chromatography work sphere, but for the most part, those are going to be restricted to highly volatile compounds where they chromatography. Uh, there are non-targeted analytical methods, meaning 
They're looking at things like total PFAS or total organic fluorine that involve different analytical methods and I think are very useful for sample screening and quick turnaround times, uh, but they don't necessarily in, in terms of the regulatory and liability frameworks provide enough information to be universally useful. Um, so we've got this basic workflow overview and, and really what I'd like to kind of just share with everybody and, and have a conversation over is, is the areas to be aware of and, and the watch outs when it comes to your analysis so that anybody that maybe hasn't been involved in testing yet can go into the, the process with a little bit more forewarning. Um, Millipore Sigma got into PFAS analysis initially within the environmental testing world. So we were focused really heavily on the EPA methods and the ASTM methods. Last year we did publish and, and uh, it was actually at the AOAC conference when we released them, a couple of methods looking at PFAS analysis in, analysis in salmon and then one in milk. Those were, were both predicated upon the FDA method uh, uh, published I actually don't remember when the original FDA method was, was published, but it was recently updated to the 0 0.02 format within the last couple of years. So um, we are starting to, to move more into the food world. We, we're getting more inquiries from clinical testing. We're getting more inquiries from uh, producers, manufacturers that want to do their own in-house types of activities that are maybe independent of food matrices. So here are, are kind of my top bullet points to remember as you're looking at PFAS analysis. First and foremost, your sample collection and preparation are going to be your, your deal breaker steps in this process. Uh, depending on what, what matrix you're working with, what type of, of uh, sample you're collecting, sample filtration, and cleanup is going to be pretty important. Not pretty important, it's critically important. The water samples that, that I have seen range all the way from, from drinking water to wastewater to surface water, uh, samples from lakes, samples from oceans, all over the place. And universally, some amount of cleanup is, is needed to remove turbidity, remove other compounds or materials that could cause interferences. So that initial cleanup step is critical in the food world. The, the catchers, both were referenced in the methods for salmon and milk. It's, it's absolutely essential that some form of cleanup take place to make sure that the extraction step, which is done through either solid phase extraction or as you can see below, solid phase micro extraction is a, is a new, well, it's not a new analytical technique or not a new lab technique, but it is being newly explored within the PFAS analysis framework. S SPME, SPE, those are going to extract the compounds out of the sample. And then uh, again, as Susie talked about, you've got your concentration steps where you're, you're doing the evaporation, blowdown and reconstitution. Those are again, areas that are, are critically important to make sure that you get your correct uh, Correct results, accurate results, I guess. So sample collection, regardless of what type of matrix you're working with, is going to be your biggest bugbear, right? Like if, if, you, if you don't have the sample prep dialed in for what it is you're trying to analyze, your numbers are going to be all over the place. The solid sample stage is all of everything that I just said is true. But then it adds an extra wrinkle where you're, you're having to perform some form of extraction where you get the PFOS compounds out of the solid and into a liquid matrices. And that's either um, I've seen people doing or, or methods where they, they soak some form of sample. They'll, they'll take cut out portions of material or they'll, they'll pulverize their, their sample and, and drop it into a test tube and then soak it in, in methanol centrifuge it and then 
extract the uh, supernatant. What's that? Extract the liquid, leave the solids behind. Sorry, I blanked on the word there. Um, I've also seen some methods where they talk about just rinsing, pouring solvent over a material to try to get extracts out, out of that and collecting the, the rinse solvents. I don't know how great those are in the long term for universal adaptation. Personally, I find the idea of using some sort of grinding slash homogenization step prior to the extraction to be the most sound approach, if that's the best way to say it. Uh, it, it. It has more universal applicability in my opinion. Um, but anyways, uh, the, the solid sample extraction, whether that's gonna be some sort of packaging material or solid you know, food sources, those are gonna be critically important in, in figuring out your sample preparation step to make sure that you're getting the accurate extraction of your samples or of the, of the compounds. Um, and then my final last slide here is hazards to consider when you're looking at your PFAS analysis. Human error is a pretty big deal uh, when it comes to PFAS analysis. The, some of the slides that Sally, Sally shared showed automated sample prep instrumentation, and I think that's a fantastic approach when feasible. Uh, and when I say feasible, I mean affordable. The... Those instruments do take a lot of the human variability out of things. Additionally, your are going to be a big area to pay attention to. Again, Sally mentioned opening up a bottle of uh, a new bottle of solvent and having your numbers skew. That is a hundred percent, absolutely a valid concern. Um, we talk to customers, or I talk to customers on on a weekly basis, where they will say that all of a sudden their PFAS numbers are wonky and it can be from the solvents, it can be from reagents, it can be from the plastic wear. Maybe they get a new lot of, of SPE tubes or um, centrifuge tubes that for whatever reason have some amount of background contamination in the materials themselves that leach into the, the samples. And that can cause a lot of heartache. And especially that's especially true as your limits of detection are, are being pushed further and further downward. The other area to consider is that some, some consumables can, ca or can be cause for false lows. Uh, using glassware is, is a big no-no. A lot of, of labs learned that early on. PFOS compounds can be sticky. And depending on the material they're exposed to, if they adhere to the walls or the materials in your equipment that won't end up in the final uh, sample that goes into your chromatography instrument which means you get false lows so looking at your material selections your suppliers making sure that you're doing everything in your best efforts to maintain the consistency of those materials is, is a big deal we're currently working on and i know a number of other manufacturers are as well developing PFAS certified consumables, meaning at the manufacturing level, we go through the process of confirming that each lot is free of background contamination or will not cause additional leaching into the samples. So keep an eye out for those, those types of offers. It's still pretty rare, pretty new. A lot of Manufacturers are looking at the best way to certify that and make sure that we're not over-promising on the capabilities of, of our products. And then finally, um, be aware that as you push the limit of detection down, the risk of environmental contamination is inverse related, inverse, re, inver, whew, <laughs> sorry is inversely related is inversely related to the level of detection meaning the lower you go the higher you you run the risk of having environmental contamination being an issue i read an article recently of of Eurofins trying to 
detect down to the parts per quadrillion level. And if their air conditioning turned on while they were running that analysis, it affected their results. So those types of things are a very valid risk and, and need to be taken into consideration. And with that, I am going to wrap it up and we can go from here. Thank you so much, Taylor. That was great. And I'm, I really appreciate you uh, going through your vacation to help contribute to our to our talk today. So I know we're we're almost at time, everyone, but I do want to, I, I have a couple questions in the chat, so I want to get to those if our speakers have a couple minutes. Um, one quickly, just a comment from Steve uh, earlier from our AFTO rep is that uh, for those of you who are interested, AFTO has a tracking state legislation, um, is tracking state legislation this year, and they have some on PFAS bills, specifically 32 bills it looks like we're tracking pertaining to PFAS and food and food products. So take a look at the chat if you want to see that link. Um, a question for one of our speakers, I'm, I think this might go to Jared or anyone, but uh, Latanya asked, what's an example of a non-essential use product when you're talking about PFAS? That's a good question. I think it'd probably depend on, you know, who you ask in terms of um, industry. You know, I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, we, we hear from NGOs or, or is that, you know, it's not necessary in a way packaging um, or it's not necessary for use in like a cleaning product or a cosmetic. Um, they generally point to the fact that there are alternatives available in the marketplace, um, you know, for barrier purposes and, you know, these can be phased out. And so I think part of this is looking at these types of alternative analyses and um, Washington State actually is part of their PFAS um, um, regulatory program looks at um, alternatives analysis to decide whether or not um, you know, PFAS can be phased out of different types of products. Great. Thank you, Jared. Um, and then I think this next, I'm going to combine your questions, Laxman, um, for Susie, I think is probably the best person to take these, but um, which foods and beverages are most or least prevalent with PFAS-related uh, additive additives, and have there been any restrictions for their use? Uh, I would say the we haven't really measured foods that have been contaminated through, you know, packaging or those types of things. The main, the main types of uh, foods we find that have PFAS in them are typically um, products that have been contaminated through the environment. So seafood is probably, you know, the number one um, just because it is in, you know, lives in the aquatic environment, which is a huge sink for these analytes. Uh, we also, you know, we've done a lot of work for states, labs, and working with them with farms that have, especially the state of Maine, which has had contaminated biosolid spread all over their fields. And so, um, you know, we've measured, uh, and again, looking at those direct sources of environmental contamination, we'll see it in, you know, the crops, the eggs, the milk, um, the livestock. So uh, again, those tend to be specific to those sources where we know of a known source um, says so that, but yeah. But in the general food supply, I would say seafood is probably uh, the number one uh, detect that we see. And I would add, I would add as well. Sorry, <laughs> that there's there, the, the number of uses in the food side in terms of food packaging is pretty narrow, from what my understanding is. Um, you still see it currently in pet food packaging. Um, in certain in certain instances, some um, foils and and. Um, films for bakery products um and those are sort of like the main categories that you know are still being used and phased out great thank you jared and then one more question for all three of you um is there one particular innovation you've seen uh related to pfas whether it's testing uh final product or some sort of innovation in the past year or so um that you think is going to make a big change i know taylor you had mentioned the certified materials if you have any other thoughts on that um, but yeah, maybe each of you could respond if you have an answer. Yeah, I, I don't I know that I could. Oh, go ahead, Susie. Oh yeah, I was just going to add. Yeah, I mean, I I think yeah, what Taylor said with the certified reference materials, you know, NIST. Is having is going to be coming out with some by the end of this year, which I think is going to make a big change in getting labs out there certified and ISO accredited for looking at PFAS and foods, um, which right now is a challenge right now to find materials um, for labs to become accredited at this point. Go ahead, Taylor. Uh, okay, um, I actually don't know that I can think of a single product or technology that is going to, to make a huge difference in, in the coming years. But I, I do think there's a, a greater 
maybe better mentality around redesigning products. I, I read a, a article recently about Keen, the company that does footwear, completely reevaluating their, their entire production process and going through the thought process that they had to go through to remove PFOS from all of their products was fascinating. And I think that type of mentality and forward thinking and, and willingness to tackle the challenge is really going to be what ultimately moves the needle in our society. Uh, we can't kick the can down the road on this issue. It That's what's got us to where we're at now. Thank you, Taylor. And Jared, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you earlier. No, no, it's okay. I, I didn't mean to interrupt Taylor. Um, I, I, I think... You know, just to echo, I think Taylor's comments. Um, it's it's hard for me to point to specific, you know, specific products products that we're seeing innovation. But I do know from what I from my communications with my members that you know reformulation is an active thing that they are looking at and making efforts to do, or have already done, um, to make sure that their packaging doesn't have intentionally you know added PFAS in it. So it's something that they you know it's it's a risk management activity that they're all very cognizant uh, cognizant of. Great. Wonderful. Well, everyone, I know we're over time, so I just want to thank our speakers again for your great support today and every, all the attendees for your wonderful questions. Please feel free to reach back out um, to one of us. If you have follow-up questions for our speakers, I can always pitch them and see if uh, they can provide some additional answers for you all. And Latanya, I don't want to close this out. Thank you. Yes, I know we're at time, but I do want to thank our excellent speakers, you know, who just took time out of their schedule, whether from work or on vacation, and just provide a wealth of information and resources on the anti corrosion resistance and the regulatory industry challenges of PFI. So thank you again. And as Sally noted, both topics were extremely insightful. I also want to personally thank my co-chair, Sally. Sally, you know, for moderating, doing the lion's share in the work and pulling these presentations together. So thank you, Sally. So as I mentioned at the outset of the meeting, if the speakers can share their slides, we will post them under the committee's portal on the AFTO website. I don't think we have time, but I'll just quickly say, if you go to AFTO.org and click the committees and portals tab, and then you click all committee, you can then click our International Government Relations Committee portal. Um, and AFTO will post the link to the recording after the meeting to the uh, there as well. Lastly, Sally and I would love for you to join the International Government Relations Committee. If you don't have to be a member of AFO to join the committee, so please consider signing up and being a part of this wonderful group of stakeholders who come from federal, state, local government, industry, academia, and consumer advocacy groups. Um, we hold monthly meetings, and we generally hold them on Thursdays, but depending upon our schedules, and then we'll meet around, starting, we'll start meeting around September and October timeframe, um, and then go into June. And then, well, I said lastly, but this is really the last thing. If you're attending the AFTO Educational Conference in a few weeks in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I look forward to meeting you and reconnecting with you. So again, thank you all for joining our committee session. Have a great day and take care. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.